Hello and welcome to the Quest on Rajya Sabha TV. I am Rakhi Bakshi. The show gives you a deep insight into the life, career and vision of a leading personality. And that leading personality this week is Professor K. Srinath Reddy. He is the president of PHFI, that's Public Health Foundation of India. Welcome to the show, sir. Thank you. You know, I have interviewed many politicians earlier and I used to ask them why politics. But now that I am talking to you, I want to ask you, knowing your background, that why not politics? You opted to be a professional. Well, I presume you are referring to my family yeah. background when my father was actually in the parliament and the minister for a while. Yeah. Uh, I did grow up in a political environment at home, but I also grew up in a family which prized academics. My mother is a doctor. Mm -hmm. uh, she was a professor of obstetrics and gynecology. My father a lawyer and an economist. The house was full of books. And I did at one point in time want to opt for liberal arts, sociology, political science and economics as my subjects okay. in college uh, while I was still at school. But my father persuaded me that it would be useful to have a professional degree, hmm. that many of these subjects are something that we can learn even by self-directed learning. But having a professional degree, A, would ensure that I would be useful to somebody or other in life. Okay. And secondly, it would also give me a sense of purpose and security in life. And uh, we uh, understand that you actually, despite all these temptations that young people have, chose not to go uh, abroad and uh, invest your energy further there, but you decided to be in India and serve. Yes, actually more than half of my classmates are abroad at the moment. And that was the done thing when I graduated from medical college in Hyderabad, in Usmania Medical College. And uh, many of them are now in the United States. But I felt that I would be much more relevant in this country that even if I would achieve professional success abroad, I would not be able to make much of a difference. There would be many people doing the kind of things that I would be doing. Mm. Whereas in this country, I would certainly make a difference given the fact that I would actually be able to contribute something more in a place which badly needed a lot mm -hmm. of professional help in the area of health. Let's try and understand where you've reached and kind of, you know, take uh, the viewers down the chain, actually. Uh, you took, of course, cardiology also and you, of course, are uh, somebody who is known so much for public health and so many policies, which we'll talk later about. But uh, why, uh, why this career path as such? Firstly, I, once I finished my medical education, I came into All India Institute of Medical Sciences to do my training in internal medicine because it was the best institute in the country. And while training there, in fact, there was a temporary dalliance I had with immunology. I wanted to specialize in immunology. Yeah. He, once again, my father sort of stepped into my life. I mean, he never ordered me or anything like that, but he guided me. And he said, look, do you want to work in India or do you want to work abroad? I said, very much in India, because that's where I belong and that's where I'll make a difference. So he said, immunology is a specialty, at least at that time, where you would need big laboratory support, very sophisticated laboratories okay. to m make substantial contributions. And they are at the moment not available in India. So if you are planning a career abroad and are willing to settle abroad, fine, take up immunology. If you want to stay in India, take something which you can actually work with while in India mm -hmm. and still make a difference. But hasn't, been, uh, hasn't this been a challenge, sir, because uh, you're talking about public health and something that you've really worked a lot on. But we are talking at a time when it's a huge challenge when we talk about our country. Yes. I mean, uh, following my uh, choices, as you said, I did practice cardiology and I focused substantially on preventive cardiology. While working in preventive cardiology, I also recognized that you needed to address the broader dimensions of public health, not merely treat heart disease once it has occurred mm. Uh, mm. and comes to the hospital. That you need, of course. Mm. But prevention of heart disease and prevention of other diseases is absolutely critical. And as I got more engaged with public health dimensions of cardiology, then I started appreciating also the public health dimensions of many other health problems. Mm -hmm. And I said public health in this country definitely requires much greater participation by health professionals with commitment. Mm -hmm. And I also formally trained as an epidemiologist in Canada so that I could get a better understanding of the causation of disease, the determinants of disease, mm -hmm. and how public health action should be directed mm -hmm. to prevent disease and control it appropriately. How much do you think we have traveled? I mean, um, what kind of journey we have made? <laughs> we, we, 
uh, with your kind of interest and work that you've done. How mm -hmm. do you feel at this stage? Well, I think there's a lot that needs to be done in this country. We have gained a lot since our independence in terms of life expectancy, 30 years. Yeah. That's quite a lot. Mm -hmm. But it's very unequally distributed. 57 years of life expectancy in Madhya Pradesh versus 74 years in Kerala. Why can't every state be like Kerala? Our infant mortality and maternal mortality rates are fairly high compared to even our neighboring countries. Our undernutrition rates in children are higher than in sub-Saharan Africa. And at the same time, we are seeing heart disease, diabetes, mental illness, road traffic accidents galloping mm. and rising very rapidly in order to kill many people in their 40s and 50s or even earlier. Yeah. So if all of these need to be tackled by a health system, our health system has not been ready either with resources or with efficiencies mm -hmm. to cope with all of these challenges. And that's why I believe public health needs not only to look at prevention and health promotion, mm -hmm. but also how to create an efficient health system mm -hmm. which can provide services the people need across the country, mm -hmm. across the life course, right yeah. from the time you are in the womb till the time you are very elderly. So we'll talk about all that and much more, but we are right now talking to Professor K. Srinath Reddy. You're watching The Quest. Please keep watching it and don't go away. We are coming back shortly. <laughs> Welcome back to the show. You're watching The Quest. We are in conversation with Professor K. Srinath Reddy. Sir, uh, when I was reading about you, there's so many Lawrence achievements, of course, you have got, but uh, the kind of work you've done is really commendable and uh, talking about some of the uh, expert groups that you are on, uh, whether it's uh, UN's thematic group on health for all or uh, you are also on the some so many expert committees that you are a member on. Um, what is this whole uh, scene like when we talk about India in terms of public health and we look at the global scenario? Where, I mean, I mean, as I assume, things are not really so satisfying. We have to really make a long journey still. People everywhere wonder why India, which has been doing so well in terms of its economy, at least even in recent years, it's doing better than many other countries anyway, why it has fallen behind in the area of health. And part of the reason, of course, is very clear that we spend very little of our public financing on health. Mm -hmm. But there are multiple other reasons as well. So in terms of the global context, I think India needs to catch up with many other countries but not so much for their sake, but for our own sake, because our development is critically hinged to the health and education and skills of our young people. Mm. In the next 20 to 30 years, we are going to see a very young India. And if we cannot capitalize on the dem demographic dividend of that young and pro potentially productive population, then we are going to be failing. Mm -hmm. And if we don't invest in health and education, mm then we will not be able to harness this potential. But as you're saying this, sir, the, all these critical points, for example, whether the rising fees, whether the lack of medical colleges, whether, whether the budget not really looking and giving so much priority to health as such, all these uh, issues are still there. And um, uh, some would say, why not infrastructure status to health as such? Firstly, I think we need greater prioritization of health by the political decision makers. Yeah. So far, health has not figured very high up in their list of priorities. But they must recognize that without investing in health, we cannot assure the development of this country. Even take undernutrition. Mm. Apart from children falling sick, the amount of loss of brain power, I mean, if the cognitive development in the brain is actually impeded by undernutrition, mm. you're using a, losing a huge amount of brain power. So there are so many reasons why we must invest in health. And Politicians must recognize that over the next three or four decades, if we don't set right our health system and improve our health state of the, uh, status of the population, we are going to fall behind in terms of our economic growth. But, uh, but the government came out with schemes for call it NRHM or National Urban uh, Rural Mission, Urban Mission actually and now making it NHM actually. All these schemes are fine there, uh, but how much is it actually impacting in terms of affecting the lives of common people, uh, especially people at the lower strata. And we are also talking about providing very basic services to them all. It is making some difference. I mean, there are uh, actually uh, people who are benefiting from the services in rural areas because of the National Rural Health Mission. And I hope the Urban Health Mission also will attend to the needs of the urban poor. Mm -hmm. However, what Which has not been fla flagged off. Actually. Which has just been approved, but not yeah. been flagged off yet, not implemented yet. Yeah. But 
the critical missing element in our health system has been primary health care. Mm. Primary health care has long been neglected. Even NRHM only focuses minimally on maternal and child health. Important as it is, that is not all of primary health care. So, and in urban areas, primary health care doesn't even exist. Mm. Unless we strengthen primary health care mm. so that the basic health services are provided to people, mm. health promotion, disease prevention, mm. essential basic medical care with appropriate referral linkages to higher levels of care, mm. we will find a large number of people falling ill when they should not be falling ill and people being referred to costly hospitals so, when they don't need to so be So how this problem of resource allocation is being addressed, sir, since you are at the helm of affairs in terms of... I'm not at the helm the, of affairs. In, I'm in terms a, of the think tank. <laughs> I'm very much an advocate. I'm an academic. I'm an advocate. I'm an activist. Yeah. I mean, I don many hats. Uh, but in the planning commission, yeah. the high-level expert group which exactly, I chaired exactly. made a very strong recommendation that a minimum requirement of public financing in the 12th five-year plan should be 2.5 percent of the GDP up from 1 percent. And we said in the third five-year plan it should go up to at least 3 percent. Mm. I mean, uh, we, should, we could have been asking for 5 percent, we could have been asking for 6 percent, but we were realistic. But we said with at least 3 percent we will be able to assure that most of the needed health services are provided to all of the people. But while the Twelfth five-year plan did promise to go up to 1.87 percent from about 1 percent. Even that is not being reflected in the budgets that are being yeah. framed. And also, we are talking about this whole imbalance. One uh, looks at uh, health expenditure, and one looks at the private players. So there is still this uh, lack of balance between how the government would look at it and how the private players who are coming in. So how would you look at uh, this kind of a scenario? I think firstly we must recognize that in India. The out-of-pocket expenditure from per pocket personal expenditure is 70% of all healthcare expenditure. There are very few countries in the world with that high level of out-of-pocket expenditure. Sure. Close to 60 million Indians fall into poverty each year because of unaffordable health care. Mm -hmm. And the private sector, which has grown by default, is not bothered about the affordability of health care. And it is now becoming a major problem in terms of the type of care that it is providing at uh, tertiary care and even to some extent in secondary care without any linkage to primary care. So what we need is to strengthen primary care and strengthen the public services, especially the district hospitals exactly. and the medical college hospitals. And since the private and more medical colleges, which remains, we, we, we do we do need more medical colleges. Mm -hmm. But most of the medical colleges are concentrated in the four southern states and in Maharashtra, exactly. whereas states like UP, Bihar, and the Northeast have very few. And as a result, you don't have many doctors being produced there and staying back there. Mm -hmm. So we need to correct that imbalance by opening new medical colleges linked to district hospitals, mm -hmm. strengthen district hospitals which itself is good for health services, but, but, but use that for sir, teaching as well. But do you think the scene is changing? Um, you're talking about more doctors now going to rural areas or more, in fact, staying in India, not uh, going uh, abroad. Do you think the scene is changing? or? Uh, I, I don't think it's changing very much. If doctors are going less abroad, that may be because of restrictions elsewhere, mm -hmm. uh, rather than the fact that they are volitionally staying back. Mm -hmm. I think we need to create a system in which doctors also feel productive. See, one point is that we must, of course, encourage our doctors to go to rural areas, mm. but create the infrastructure, create the social amenities where they can work well. Mm. If they have to go to a primary health care center where there is no electricity, no water supply, no telephone, drugs are available only for two months in a year. No, let me put the question in another help. manner is that uh, when it comes again to the medicine or the world of health, uh, the money, of course, uh, uh, starts playing a very important role. So why look at money, but look at service? That's how it should be looked at. Of course. I mean, I'm not suggesting that doctors should be really looking at uh, the bottom line and trying to earn a lot of money. But the fact is that we do need a system which is well regulated. Mm -hmm. See, both in terms of cost and quality, the public sector as well as the private sector need to be well regulated. Our regulatory systems are very weak in terms of health. That's why the private sector has grown to the extent it has, mm -hmm. unmindful of the people's needs and much more focused on its own bottom line of profit. Mm -hmm. So, of course, we are talking to Professor K. Srinath Reddy and we will continue to talk to him, but don't go away. We are coming back shortly. You are watching The Quest.
Welcome back. You're watching the quest. We are talking to Professor Srinath Reddy. Uh, so tobacco free India, that's what you've really fought for. And uh, we have come to the stage where in cinema now we watch that scroll coming up. Uh, so that's a great journey, actually. Uh, how would you look at this fight still going on? Well, in the mid 1970s, the government of India could not get a legislation passed in the parliament. And uh, in mid 1990s, again, they failed. But by year 2001, we had the international negotiations starting and by year 2003, not only we had the global treaty on tobacco control, but we also had the Indian parliament unanimously passing the tobacco control legislation. I think those of us in the tobacco control movement should feel very happy that it has happened and that many things have happened, whether it's a ban on advertising or ban on smoking in public places and indoor workplaces, which are good. Mm -hmm. However, there are still some things which are missing. Our tobacco products are not adequately taxed. Even cigarettes could do with more taxes, but BDs in particularly have been let off very easily. And oral tobacco, though the Gutka ban is there recently, and that's again a good thing, mm -hmm. by and large has not been taxed very highly. Mm -hmm. And taxation, which increases the prices and reduces consumption, mm -hmm. especially among poor people, women and children, where the disposable incomes are low and they, the price actually makes a big difference. Okay. Taxes should be used as one of the major instruments for tobacco control. Mm -hmm. That's yeah, not in happening. Fact, uh, That's you, not happening. you said somewhere and as I was reading that, uh, uh, you know, creative freedom is one thing, but you know, how everybody should respect that uh, what is good for health and also that how cinema or creative mediums have a, have a role to play in terms of spreading social messages. Uh, absolutely. I mean, I. I'm not opposed to creative freedom at all. In fact, I respect creative freedom, especially in the film media. Mm -hmm. But however, you cannot use that as a peg to position cigarettes or tobacco unnecessarily, either by way of products or by way of showing unnecessary consumption. Mm -hmm. The real challenge to creativity is to create a storyline which doesn't require these kind of props. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Very true. Um, we also understand, I mean, coming back to a little bit of about uh, your interest as such also, that you're interested in music, you're fond of reading uh, literature. So what is it like when you're not actually uh, thinking about public health or writing or advocating about it? Well, I'm, I do watch old movies, both English and Hindi, and I love some of them. And I love old music, particularly old Hindi music. I'm not very musically trained, but I appreciate it nevertheless. And uh, secondly, I love reading. I love read books and magazines, and that's how I like to really uh, relax. You also had, and uh, many of uh, the our viewers should know that you had the medical expert team of physicians uh, uh, on the Prime Minister's health panel, and you, of course, look after that. Uh, how's life been? Uh, you know, uh, dealing with uh, you know it all in terms of your daily routine. Well, actually, when I was a personal physician to Mr. Narsimha Rao, life was much busier because I had to travel a lot with him. Now, Dr. Singh has other doctors looking after him on a regular basis. I only supervise supervise, and or at least uh, uh, I'm chair the panel and um, my visits are not as frequent. But I think this is an important part of uh, uh, contributing to the country by looking after the country's top leader. And uh, certainly in terms of personal interaction with Dr. Singh, it's one of the most pleasant things that can happen because he's one of the most cultured, courteous persons one could ever meet. Mm. Sir, we are talking at a time when we are looking at, um, you know, some new idioms in politics uh, coming up. Uh, we are seeing a party which has just made its debut, Aam Admi Party, coming up. So talking about uh, these governance issues and uh, your thoughts on it, I mean, how politics is also getting a different kind of space altogether. Well, actually, the model, the model of democratic governance is changing from the 20th century to the 21st century. Uh, the, in the 20th century, it was mostly representational in character. You elected somebody and left, it, left everything to that person. In the 21st century, it is going to be much more citizen participatory in nature. The citizens want to participate. I'm not only talking about what's happened in the Arab countries or elsewhere, mm -hmm. but because of the communication channels that are there now, People want to respond readily to daily events mm. and participate in the decision-making process. In one sense, it's very good because it increases transparency. It really brings democratic content. Mm. On the other hand, if it's not adequately controlled, it can be anarchic. We need to find the right balance. 
but i think the old habit of saying that okay we'll go back every 5 years to the people and we can do what we want with in within this 5 years is no longer going to work because people are going to be vocal demanding action demanding results demanding accountability and adding their voice to the whole governance process which is a healthy thing mm -hmm. so on behalf of people also uh, talking about again public health what would you ideally ask for on behalf of people firstly i would ask for universal health coverage in which the government spends more particularly using the tax based income and we can have a lot more tax recoveries and less of tax concessions mm. to raise the revenue pool for uh, providing universal health coverage to people so that all the basic health needs are met definitely for everybody across the country but i would also think that we must invest in what are called the social determinants of health health in other policies also in other sectors too the policies must become more aligned to health whether it's water sanitation nutrition environment agricultural policies yeah. food systems yeah. urban design urban you're, transport you are a member on the global uh, panel on uh, agriculture so, and uh, food systems and true. nutrition so. see all of these have to become more sensitive and aligned to health concerns if they go their own way they may actually end up destroying people's health and the health ministry will only be the mopping brigade trying to clear up the mess created by policies in finally, other sectors and finally as we are wrapping up uh, you're a pan bhushan you're also president of world heart federation and all that and so many other things that you actually are involved into uh, what's your quest now uh, professor reddy at this stage of your life well i'm quite happy doing what i am doing and i really want to see young people taking up public health careers and really making an impact on this country improving the health status of this country not only through the health sector but even through other sectors as i said but influencing health and development and promoting equity in health as well as in other sectors of uh, the country i would like really india to blossom with the efforts efforts of these young people and if i can not only influence them but assist them in some manner it will be good and uh, then in a couple of years maybe i will want to start writing books and take a little more easy when these people actually step up to the plate thank you so much for joining this show and all the very best for whatever you do so that was professor shinath reddy we were in conversation with hope you like this particular edition of the quest keep watching namaskar and bye bye